Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's lecture, our biennial lecture. My name is Joseph Cronin. I'm the director of the Leo Beck Institute London. This is our second event now since the um, terrorist attack on Israel and its consequent qu consequences continue to reverberate. Um, now, unfortunately, also in Europe and the UK. And this uh, is very much at the forefront of our minds. Um, earlier this week, the Central Welfare Board of Jews in Germany issued a statement in which they said that the anti-Semitism produced by the attack represented, quote, an unprecedented caesura for Jewish life in Germany after 1945, and that it fears for the long-term future of the Jewish community in Germany. That is the, the situation in which we currently find ourselves. Um, and so I think tonight's lecture um, couldn't be more pertinent. Um, it is called um, The Shoah and the Tragedy of Assimilation, Lessons from One German Jewish Family. And it will be delivered by Professor Simon May, uh, who is visiting professor of philosophy at King's College London. Um, professor May's interests lie in ethics, the philosophy of the emotions, questions of identity and belonging, and German 19th and 20th century thought, uh, especially the work of Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and Heidegger. Professor May's monographs include Nietzsche's Ethics and his War on Morality, published by Oxford University Press in 1999, Love, a History, published by Yale University Press in 2011, Love, a New Understanding of an Ancient Emotion, published by Oxford University Press in 2019, and The Power of Cues, published by Princeton University Press, uh, also in 2019. Um, uh, so alongside being a, a, an academic philosopher, Simon May is also an established public intellectual, uh, he, he has written op-ed articles for newspapers such as the Washington Post and the Financial Times. Uh, and he is a devotee of the aphoristic form um, and has published a, a book of his own aphorisms called Thinking Aloud, a collection of aphorisms, which was named the Financial Times Book of the Year in uh, 2009. It's the book that I will be checking out since I particularly like aphorisms. Um, his aphorisms have also been included in Geary's Guide to the World's Great Aphorists, published by Bloomsbury. Simon May's work has been translated into 10 languages uh, and has been reviewed in major publications all over the world. So it is an absolute honor to have uh, as our speaker tonight, Professor Simon May. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to, to extend a very warm welcome to him for tonight's lecture. Well, thank you for that very nice introduction. And I think I can probably cancel therapy for at least six months. Um, and uh, thank you for the invitation to, to deliver this lecture, um, which is not necessarily emotionally easy for me, though I've spoken about this subject now since the book was published two years ago many times, but each time it's something of a challenge. Um, so all the family, I'm going to speak about uh, today are dead. The love I feel for them, including for those I never knew, is nourished by more than gratitude, more than desire to safeguard their memory, more too than reverence for what they endured. It's a love that can be every bit as powerful as love for the living. Indeed, I've always felt that love for our dead might be the purest of all forms of love. For evidently, the loved one can neither expect it of us, nor can we expect anything from them in return for it. 
as the philosopher Søren Kierkegaard argues, love for the dead is also the freest love because it is never, as he puts it, extorted. Unlike the living, who can demand by seduction or pleading or cajoling of multiple forms, overt and covert, that we love them. And in his book, Works of Love, Kierkegaard says this, in order to test properly whether love is entirely free, one removes everything that could in any way extort from one any work of love. But this is absent in the relationship to one who is dead. If love continues, then this is the freest love. Now the dead might, as Kierkegaard avers, never demand love from us, but their relationship to us is far from passive. They're often, like all those we most profoundly love, unobtrusive lodestars and anchors of our being. They pose the deepest questions to us, questions that if we're capable of listening carefully enough can end up structuring the whole trajectory of our life. They help set ultimate goals. They enable us to become who we are and to fulfill our most hidden potential. They're sources of life with, who we can, with whom we can be in intimate relation and extended dialogue. This is why remembering our ancestors who perished in the Third Reich, or whose lives were catastrophically upended by it, isn't just something we do for them, a duty we owe them, a vital tribute to destroyed existences. Nor is it just about remaining vigilant to an unsurpassed horror so that it never happens again. Remembrance is also about coming to grasp and to give thanks for what Hitler's victims do for us. Remembrance brings them into the present, not only as memories or monuments, but above all as powerful guides of our love of our lives today. In my own life, my mother's father and uncle, Ernst and Theodor Liedke, both of them killed by the Third Reich, and both of them, of course, who, who, who I never met, have reciprocated and continue to reciprocate my love in exactly this way, as lodestars, as bequeathing values, life goals, and treasured ways of living, and as posing fundamental questions, above all about identity and belonging. Their challenges to me are a life's unfinished work. They constitute the heritage out of which my own trajectory has been forged. The words of Goethe's Faust, much of which they typical for their kind, knew by heart, come to mind. Was du erb von deinen Vätern hast, Erwerbes um es zu besitzen. What you've inherited from your ancestors, you must earn in order to make it your own. At the same time, my relationship to these beloved ancestors, relatively pure and free though it might be, is by no means uncomplicated. Nor is it free of a kind of irritated contempt for the mistakes they made. Above all, the appalling complacency about their security in German society before 1933 and the insoluble legacy of existential fragility that they bequeathed to their descendants, which can make it a Sisyphean task for us to find an unquestionable place in the world. Although I'm sure that I would have succumbed to exactly the same complacency had I lived when they did, it is remarkably difficult in practice to be, and I quote, just towards the past, unquote, which in a note from 1881, Nietzsche calls the highest test of our nobility. If we imagine ourselves back into, say, 1932, and I'm just going to put on, if I can get this right, the first slide. Wait a minute. So this is, these are the two people I'm talking about, my grandfather and my great uncle, actually on their way from Bremen to New York on the Kaiser Wilhelm at Zweite um, in, in uh, 1909. If we imagine ourselves back into, say, 1932, the year before Hitler's ascent to power, 
my grandfather Ernst, who you see on the left of that photo, my mother's father, seems to flourish in the capital of the German Reich beyond the imaginings of any of his own ancestors. He is and takes himself to be a beneficiary of the long process of assimilation that many German Jews have undergone after the Prussian Edict of Emancipation of 1812. Vast progress has been made since 1743, when the great Enlightenment philosopher Moses Mendelssohn, trailblazing a path out of the ghetto and later to be known as the German Socrates, reputedly found, I don't know if this is true or apocryphal, but anyway, reputedly found that he could enter Berlin only through the gate reserved for cattle, swine, and Jews. However fragile and deluded this progress of emancipation might seem to us now in retrospect, however much we might now see it as a house of cards waiting to collapse, to my grandfather, his world seemed blissfully safe. Of course, the menace of anti-Semitism was nothing new. It had been there for as long as he could bear to recall it. Nonetheless, as my mother, his daughter, testified, it was a reality against which the real and imagined solidity of his life insulated him. And solidity, slightly to the elevation of me and my brother, was the word always used by my the older generation, uh, not only on my mother's side, but also my father's side. My father also came from Germany, he was from Cologne, um, to describe prosperous, cultured, assimilated Jewish life in Germany before Hitler. Alles fight by uns so solide was the maddening phrase. Everything about our lives was so solid. And from the perspective of 1932, Ernst, my grandfather, had it all. He had a senior position in one of Berlin's leading law courts, which is on the Elsalstrasse, which actually still exists. In fact, it's Germany's, I gather, Germany's oldest surviving court to this day. Three talented daughters, the oldest Ilse, the middle one Ursel, Ursula, and the youngest, my mother, Mariana, usually unusually for those days, all destined to embark on professions. Ilza, a photographer, Orsel, an actress, and my mother, a violinist. A large apartment in Berlin West, the magic West pro pronounced V, like Oi V, in German, spoken of with awe by my mother and her sisters, for it denoted a protected zone of high culture with its impregnable ethic of seriousness and learning and its veneration of music and philosophy and art and writing. Vacations in the Swiss Alps and in Italy, the Swiss Alps having a profoundly spiritual, metaphysical, whatever word you want to use, to them all, as was not untypical for Germans at that time. There's a, a snap. A boat on the Vanze for weekends, although apparently not one member of the family really knew how to sail it. There they are having afternoon tea, I think, on it. And though Ernst and my grandmother light the Shabbat candles every Friday evening at his mother's house, there is otherwise no more Jewishness. That he sees, they see, both of them, as behind them, banished to the past, anachronistic, even inauthentic. He discreetly recognizes and is intensely proud of the greatness of his Jewish heritage, but it, to him it's the ladder that's prepared Jews to climb to the heights of German culture, and which can now, and in fact must now, be dispensed with. Jewish heritage is yesterday, it's preparatory, but the future is Germany, a nation of deep thinkers, dazzling musicians, epoch-making scientists, discipline, order, and integrity, uh, Einstein, Schoenberg, and so on, innumerable inventors of the future. For him and his kind, it's the greatest culture in the contemporary West, Athens on the, on the river Spree, crucially, and of course, ironically, in view of what was to come, Athens without slaves and with opportunities for all. In my grandparents' 12-room apartment in a street called Blumershof, a street which was bombed off the map in the war, there were musical evenings, poetry readings and visits by illustrious musicians and writers. 
Jews and non-Jews mingled unselfconsciously, so my mother reported. In a memoir entitled A Berlin Childhood and the Berliner Kindheit, the writer of Walter Benjamin, whose own grandmother, Hedwig Schoenfließ, lived until her death in the apartment directly above my grandparents, gives a sense of the spaciousness of the apartments in this very building, Blumenshof 12. The rooms in this apartment on the Blumenshof, Benjamin writes, were not only numerous, but in some cases very large. To reach my grandmother at her window, I had to cross the huge dining room and attain the furthest end of the living room. Only feast days, above all Christmas day, could give an idea of the capaciousness of these rooms. Yes, my grandparents, like Walter Benjamin's grandmother, like Freud's household in Vienna, and like countless other German-speaking Jews, celebrated Christmas, complete with a tree, the traditional cooked goose, and cookies of jerk, ginger, almond, and other seasonal fare laid out on brightly colored plates. And of course, a table for each of their children with presents. The idyll of Blumershof, as Benjamin uh, himself attests, was potent. Its moral order seemed indestructible, an upholstered universe of impeccable structure. The rougher sides of Berlin, poverty, anarchy, bigotry, and later the brown shirts, were literally out of sight and out of mind, practically denied even into this century, the 21st century in words that almost exactly describe how my mother and her two sisters referred to their childhood home, Walter Benjamin, in that same memoir of his childhood, which I just referred, asks of his grandmother's apartment upstairs, and I quote, what words can describe the almost immemorial feeling of bourgeois security that emanated from these rooms? And he goes on, poverty and even death itself could have no place in them, end of quote. The whole street of Blumershof, he adds, and I quote again, has become for me an Elysium, unquote. And so it was that this tremendous sense of the solidity of a deeply assimilated life, epitomized by the apartment in which death itself could have no place. So it was that this allowed my grandfather to make one further and immense step. He converted to Christianity just before the birth of his first child, my Aunt Ilza, thus formalizing and cementing his break from Jewish tradition. In this, of course, he followed many German Jewish luminaries that's very well known these days, such as Karl Marx, Felix Mendelssohn, Heinrich Heine in the 19th century, and Gustav Mahler and Schoenberg in the 20th, among many others who are not so well known, they had become Christians in the hope, as Heine put it, of conversion being the entrance ticket to acceptance by German and Western civilization. But then on the 30th of January, 33, Hitler comes to power. Just a few weeks later, on the 17th of April, 33, a Monday, Ernst walks as usual from his home in Blumershof to the law court arriving as he always does punctually at 8.30 a.m., but now to an unexpected greeting from his normally courteous clerk, a greeting which my mother would re repeat in disbelieving horror until the day she died, which is now almost nine years ago. How here so fought up to Ostasiatische Affe, get out of here immediately, you East Asian monkey, the young clerk yells, contemptuously using the familiar do, that would otherwise have been an inconceivable way of addressing any colleague, let alone a superior. He then slams the door in Ant's face. The shock to my grandfather is of course devastating, but to his great surprise, his dismissal turns out to be temporary. He's invited back to work a few weeks later as the courts cannot do without nearly 50% of Berlin lawyers who were then Jews. He isn't, however, reinstated to his former role. Now he's confined to back office work out of public view and is no longer permitted to appear in court. Clearly he is there 
only for as long as he could be of residual use and until Hitler rejects once and for all any pleas for pragmatism. Ernst might be in his old court, but his colleagues and the authorities are palpably uninterested in his patriotism, his Protestantism, or his devoted professionalism, or indeed in the medal he won for German intelligence in the First World War. He knows that the door has been slammed shut, not just to his legal offices, but to Germany itself. This knowledge and the realization that on no earnings he will soon be unable to provide for his young family wears him down. He's haunted by the horror that the Jewish disease he thought he had assimilated out of existence has become a catastrophic liability and will imminently lead to his bankruptcy. The reality that his brilliant career in which he smoothly rose from humble provinciality in a community of just 500 Jews in a small West Prussian town to a position of responsibility in the capital of the Weimar Republic, that all this has been shattered overnight and he's now discardable, reusable, and then again discardable, all this overwhelms his modest but proud personality. Over the next few months, he becomes increasingly depressed. On returning from his customary walk before lunch with my grandmother on the 17th of December, 1933, he collapses and dies of a heart attack in her arms outside his own front door. Almost exactly 10 years later, in 1943, his brother Theodore, Theodore met his own end in Auschwitz, also after refusing to emigrate. Like Ernst, he too could find a meaningful life only in Germany. His heroic housekeeper, um, who lived until I think the 80s, Hedwig Kuss of all names, um, a moral human being, as ever, if ever there was one, someone who did rather than merely declared, had done everything to persuade him to emigrate while it was still possible to emigrate. And in 1941, she had arranged for him to find refuge in Hungary, which was not yet occupied by the Nazis. But Theodor had turned back at the Hungarian border, halting before what was to him an alien land and language, and retraced his steps to Berlin. And when, to Hedwig's astonishment, he reappeared at her doorstep, she took him in, rented another apartment for them both, paid for it with the money she had earned from years in his service, and sheltered him for another year at vast risk to herself. Of course, the punishment for hiding Jews by then, I think, had become death. Anyway, it was very serious until the Gestapo finally came for him in 1942. One of the questions that's preoccupied me since I was a teenager is the difference between integration and assimilation. And I know there's a large scholarly body of work on this. I'm not going to talk in a scholarly way at all about this. It's a question that obviously has assumed much larger proportions today in a world of migrants and migrant identities, where some 85 million people, I think, is the latest count, or maybe it's more, are forcibly displaced, of which at least 26 million or more are refugees. To me, integration and assimilation, at least as experienced in my own family, refer to very distinct phenomena. Integration is about social adaptation, learning to speak, dress, and behave in the manner of the majority, whereas assimilation is an internal adaptation of the heart, a kind of alchemy of the soul, in which it systematically attempts to shed or adapt its original identity and the cultural memory that goes with it. Taken to the extreme that my maternal family took it, assimilation seeks to destroy your identity before your identity destroys you. It seeks to destroy identity, not just to the outside, but above all, to the inside, to cleanse yourself of yourself, so to speak. For merely to shed its external manifestation while sustaining your ancestral self-understanding within your soul will soon give you away. Others will smell it. They will smell the contradiction, the twisted agony of the contradiction. And you will end up being more of a threat to the majority 
because your outsider status isn't clear. Precisely because you appear not merely as a hated interloper, but as a kind of cultural, spiritual Trojan horse. So you jump as far as possible from who you are before you are pushed. I was raised in a family that on my mother's side, though absolutely not on my father's, had both integrated and assimilated to their original German habitat so intensely that my parents were in many ways lost when they fled to London just before the war. Securing my, securing my mother's passage, young as she was at the time, being one of the last acts of Ernst, her father, before his death. For even the horrific extremes to which the Nazis had taken German nationalism did not diminish my parents' love for its culture, again, a very typical observation, nor their insistence on speaking the language. Of course, the Germany from which they'd escaped had told them that they weren't Germans at all anymore. Indeed, had canceled their citizenship in 1938. Meanwhile, the British authorities were recognizing them in precisely the opposite way, as very much still German and therefore as so-called enemy aliens, forbidden to take employment and denied UK citizenship. As a result, both my parents remained stateless for a decade between 1938 and 1947, existing in the permanent transience so typical of the refugee. The phrase permanent transience owed to someone, but I can't remember now who. Um, being enemy aliens who were not citizens and therefore not equal under the law, they found themselves for much of the war under nighttime curfew. It was a curfew that my mother once unthinkingly broke after returning too late from an evening playing Beethoven's string quartets. As a result, she was arrested and incarcerated in a police cell until the next morning before being released on bail paid for by a friend. Appearing before a magistrate, she charmed her way out of the charges brought against her by explaining that she was not the nighttime sex walker, worker walking the streets that the court suspected her of being and that playing quartets was not a reference to group sex. But what a blessing the whole affair turned out to be. That night, locked up in a cell, saved her life, because when she returned to her unheated room on being released, she found that it was now a pile of rubble. The building had suffered a direct hit by a German rocket. So thanks to her, her arrest, I'm here today. But going back to 1933, what happened to my grandmother and their three daughters after my grandfather's death at the end of that year? Did Hitler cause them to return to their Jewish roots as one might expect, to, see re to seek refuge in the true solidity of that abandoned heritage? The answer is a decisive no. Not even Hitler caused them to return, anyway, not in my mother's case until old age. My grandmother remained in Berlin for all the war and miraculously came to no harm. Far from seeking a way back to their ancestral religion, her three daughters, my mother and her two older sisters, converted to Catholicism after Hitler's rise to power. Aside from that, they ended up having three drastically different trajectories. One of my mother's sisters, Orzel, Orzel who was then a young classical actress in Berlin, just graduated from acting school, was expelled from her first job in 1935 after the initial raft of race laws had been enacted by the Nazi regime and then spent years in hiding. Until in 1941, still in Berlin, she achieved the rare feat of wangling official acceptance as an Aryan. Extraordinarily, she achieved it with the help of one of the most powerful deputies of Goebbels a man called Hans Hinkel, or to give him his full title, Staatsrat SS Oberführer und Reichsverwalter Hinkel. Even more extraordinarily, Hinkel, a minister in the so-called Ministry of Propaganda and the People's Enlightenment, happened to be the very person whom Goebbels had placed in charge of purging German cultural lives of Jews 
very much including budding actors like my aunt Orzel. And he, I think he became the general secretary of, of the Reichskulturkammer, which was in charge of basically cultural life in Germany at that time. Now, e ever since Orzel told me her Aryanization story when I was a child, I had known that just before this event, a young fellow acting student of hers had married the heir, and this is a clue to how this was possible, this, this process, had married the heir to Ige Farben, then the world's largest chemical company, which not only, of course, bankrolled the Nazi party, but would go on to run the slave labor camp at Auschwitz and through one of its subsidiaries to manufacture Zyklon B gas, among other atrocities. But it was only when in 2008, I found a letter in the German Federal Archives written by my aunt in her own hand to Minister Hinkle that I discovered that she had been personally received by him, something she never told me or omitted, just forgot, in his Berlin office. The letter concludes with the profounding, profoundly moving words of, and I quote, endless gratitude to you, to Hinkle, for giving me back my life, my purpose in living, unquote. To me, it's still astonishing that a young actress with no experience, whose most recent work had been in Berlin cabaret venues, sub subsequently closed down by Goebbels, who was expelled from the profession five long years beforehand and who had survived an ethnic purgatory ever since, it just seems astonishing that she found herself in 1941, of course, the year before the Holocaust begins, for, invited for an intimate chat with one of Goebbels' right-hand men. And the only explanation kept must be um, this friend whose name I remember now was Yolanda, Yolanda, Yola. And she married, I uh, can't remember the name of the people who, so the person she married was the son of the man who put Ige Farben together and was its chief executive. Um, and I've got a slide. I've been missing out slides because I've been focusing on the text, but I've got a slide of Orzel. Seems not to work. Am I doing wrong? Oh yeah, this is it. So this is, this is her. In fact, this is her with um, a fellow cabaretist, uh, who had also got herself Aryanized, who was called Kata Sterner. Her real name was Stern. And she was the niece of Kate Kolwitz. Um, so anyway, she was half Jewish. I think Kate Kolwitz's sister had married a, a Jew. Um, It also, it also astonishes me that Orzel even tried this path. Needless to say, any attempt to be deemed an Aryan was hugely risky. I mean, the very application drew attention to you was why would you apply if you had nothing to hide? And by the early 40s, if you were found to have lied about your ethnic heritage, she told me that the punishment to all concerned was death. Somehow, though, with Hinkle's help, she was successfully transformed into an Aryan and went on to marry into the German high aristocracy in September 1943 and to return to the stage and an almost normal life, as normal as life was for anybody at that time in Germany. But her fake identity didn't last long. In October 1943, just four weeks after she married and became a Countess of the Reich of Eisbleifen, her cover was blown and the Gestapo came after her one night, literally on a dark street uh, in Bremen, where she was then living for various reasons. She then fled to Holland and with the help of the Dutch underground hid for the rest of the war. Meanwhile, my mother's oldest sister, Ilse, was in Berlin running a successful photographic atelier where she photographed many leading Nazis, among them the Luftwaffe ace Ernst Udet. 
She was also engaged equally incredibly to a card carrying Nazi, uh, who my mother always said was not ever a convinced Nazi, but nonetheless, he had a, he had a card, which meant he couldn't get any work right after the war. And he was an up and coming composer of film music called Harald Bernert. He'd written the soundtrack to such popular movies as Kleiner Mann Bas Nun, the text to which was the novel by his friend Hans Fallada, who has recently come back into fashion, I think after having been forgotten for many decades. Together, he and my aunt Ilse danced away evenings at Babelsberg, then of course the Hollywood of Berlin, and were even invited to a reception of artists and writers once at Hitler's official residence in Berlin. At the same time, she belonged to a circle of writers and artists, which was on uneasy terms with the new regime. People like the writer Erich Kestner and Werner Fink, a comedian, cabaretist, actor, and author. So this is a this is at a um, a kind of something called the Ballhaus Trichter, which was in Hamburg on the Reeperbahn. And there is, uh, well, you can see, uh, yeah, um, this is Ilse here. Oh, you, you can't see. Anyway, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, portrait. Um, but then she had another parallel life because what most of her circle of writers and artists did not know was that by night she of all people if you see what i mean was hiding jews in cellars at huge risk to herself she did this together with an anglo-irish woman called christabel bielenberg who was married to a german lawyer and uh this lady christabel bielenberg wrote a very interesting memoir called when i was a german in which uh she describes Ilza's activities, hiding Jews, and how Ilza would turn up on her doorstep um, with somebody who dyed their hair blonde and who she was, who she was trying to find a cellar for at least for one or two nights. Meanwhile, my mother, the youngest of the three sisters, was the only one to leave Germany. That's my mother. That's just after the war. In London, she ensconced herself in the dense and intense world of Central European Jewish emigres, a remarkable world, of course, that included so many brilliant scientists, architects, musicians, lawyers, writers, and so on. But as I said, as an enemy alien, she was forbidden to work as a violinist and was always on the verge of hunger and homelessness. Until in 1939, she had her lucky break. Was it 939? It might have been a bit later than 939. I might have got that one wrong. The Czech government had recently exiled itself to London after Hitler invaded the Sudetenland, and Jan Masaryk, its longtime ambassador to the UK and later to be Czech foreign minister, invited her to join a piano, violin, and Czech trio called the Czech Trio that had lost its original violinist in the move from Prague. This gave my mother the first legitimate income and really established her professionally. And here's a program at the Wigmore Hall um, sometime in the war. My mother changed her name to Maria Lidka from Mayana Lidka in order for it to sound more Czech. Lidka was, I think, the name of a large chocolate factory that everybody knew, it was like Lint or Cadbury. Um, Karl Horitz, who was originally called Karl Horschitz, but was persuaded to change his name for obvious reasons, or at least to drop the SH. And Zuskind, Walter Zuskind, who later emigrated to America, became the first, anyway, one of the one of the directors of the, he became director of the Aspen Festival. I don't know whether it was the first. And here they are doing a Beethoven program at the Wigmore Hall. That's one of the, some years during the war, it says here, under the patronage of Mr. Young Mazalik. Um, in any case, this lucky break gave my mother a legitimate income and established her for the first time professionally. She also met and played numerous concerts at that time with Benjamin Britten and other composers like Michael Tippett, and through them became a champion of contemporary music. 
Yet the core of her cultural world, her real belonging, always remained the central European Jewish friends and colleagues who filled our home and whose homes in North London we would invariably visit at weekends. While the core of her religious world remained, back at that time, Catholic. And then many, many decades later, something extraordinary happened to my mother as old age began to creep up on her. Despite the distance at which in one sense she had long held a Jewish identity, she had nonetheless married a Jew, my father. She had ensured that my brother and I had had a bris. I don't know if that's too much information. Um, and uh, as I've said, her circle remained almost exclusively Jewish because it was here that she felt at home and at ease. In other words, while stubbornly purging her inner world of cultural memory and belonging to the Jewish people, she lived almost entirely with and among Jews. I mean, to a degree that actually most other refugees I knew did not. Then in 2009, out of the blue, she had a heart attack from which her doctor said she would not recover. Your mother has 72 hours to live, one doctor said to me in that pitilessly, almost deliberately matter of fact voice sometimes assumed by medics when delivering terrible news. Everything is going wrong and her body is shutting down, the well-worn euphemism for dying. There is nothing to be done. Surgery and medication will be useless. Well, that prediction turned out to be wrong. Over the next few weeks, she recovered almost to full strength without either surgery or medication. When she was well enough again, she announced that she wanted finally, after all these decades in exile, to move back to Berlin. The pain of exile had never left her, she insisted. Each time we visited Germany in my childhood and youth, she would utter the same phrase when we left. It seems, she says, so unnatural to be leaving Germany once again, and yet in view of the terrible history, also so right. But now in 2009, Germany had moved on. It had apologized repeatedly. It had paid her generous reparations, and it had returned to her and her sisters a beautiful building in Berlin's Prenzlauer Berg that the Nazis had confiscated from her parents in 1938 under the law on the Aryanization of Jewish property. And so plans to move back to the city of her birth were made. Meanwhile, her near-death experience prompted me to ask her a crucial question that had been an unspoken taboo for decades. What were her funeral instructions when the time came? Did she want to be buried as a Catholic, in a Jewish cemetery or in a secular cemetery? This brought everything back to the insoluble problem, what I thought was the insoluble problem of identity. And her reply amazed me. In the Jewish cemetery, she said, where your father is and where they all are. And she said it as if nothing could be more self-evident, no explanation, nothing. Are you sure, I asked, but you converted to Catholicism so long ago. Are you sure you don't want a Catholic burial? And what about the last rites? I want to be in that Jewish cemetery, she demanded. By that Jewish cemetery, she meant the one where my father and uncle are buried. I was stunned by her reply, despite the sage words of the great Kabbalah scholar Gershom Sholem, who overwhelmingly doubted whether all those attempts at assimilation among his fellow German Jews could ever be successful. Those whom he called, very accurately, Jews in flight from themselves. But Sholem had, his, had insisted, and I quote, that the substance of Judaism still reveals itself with absolute clarity, even in the Jew who has reached the nadir of complete assimilation, unquote. No matter, he went on, how extreme their attempts at assimilation, at self-deception about who they are, at erasing their inherited identity and changing their names, no matter how smoothly Schmuel Dembitzer becomes Siegfried Deutsch, nonetheless, he said, and I quote again, a component of Jewish feeling, a certain piety, binds all Jews to the past, unquote. Or as that self-proclaimed Jewish infidel, Sigismund Schlomo Freud, better known as Sigmund Freud, once said in, in a letter to his disciple Karl Abraham, 
the Talmudic way of thinking, Freud said, cannot disappear in us just like that. In any case, I asked my mother the same question about burial many times over the following years, and I always got the same unambiguous answer. I found it, I was pleased, but I found it hard that her reply never had a redemptive quality. It never conveyed the sense that the repudiated heritage had finally been embraced, or that a source of banishment from the world was now a harbinger of solace. Just as with her sisters at the end of their own lives, there was no explicit closure, such as that attributed to the famous, famous German-Jewish woman of letters, Rahel van Harden, a contemporary of Goethe and of course much admired by him and other luminaries of German culture, who according to her husband proclaimed on her deathbed in 1833, the thing which was the misery and misfortune of my life, having been born a Jewess, this I should now on no account wish to have missed. My mother never uttered such explicit words of reconciliation. She simply changed her mind and then announced her decision as if the previous decades of torture denial simply hadn't happened. But let's say this now in closing, I did feel a profound sense of redemptive closure when we buried her where she had wanted to be in that Jewish cemetery where they all are. The move back to Germany, the return to Berlin was not to be. This, her burial in the Jewish cemetery, was the return she actually made. As I repeatedly emphasize in the family memoir, uh, to which Dr. Cronin referred, to recount these extraordinary contortions of ethnic and cultural concealment is absolutely not to criticize them. I mean, who are those of us who've never experienced uh, racial hatred in its vehement forms, or indeed in pretty much any form, to criticize anyone's strategy to survive in such conditions? Nevertheless, my grandfather in particular has posed questions for me which I've been besieged by all my life. Did he die so quickly and was the shock so calamitous because he'd severed himself from his moorings in the ancient faith of his ancestors? Had this closing down of a whole area of innate sensibility and cultural memory fatally weakened him? Wasn't his repudiation of thousands of years of belonging also a suicide note? part of a dying that had been already going on for many years and was not yet complete. Didn't all that fighting against himself make him fatally vulnerable when the Nazi disaster struck? As I'm putting the questions, probably obvious that my answer to all of them is a reluctant, if qualified, yes. And of course, we cannot live out everything we are. We cannot live out all the identities of which we might be comprised. Some parts of our mosaic of identity speak to us with such familiarity and intensity that all our other roots seem insipid by comparison. I know people with one Jewish grandparent, and there are some like Ruth in the Bible with none, who claim this heritage as their chief identity and become pious Jews and feel they finally found a home to which they're unequivocally called. And I know others with the same heritage who to this day are utterly hostile to it. My grandfather Ernst confronts me with these issues and questions in the starkest possible terms. His brother Theodor, who also couldn't imagine an existence with, that wasn't German, echoes those questions more faintly but equally poignantly. Neither has a grave to which I can return. There are no plots of earth that have permitted them to rest. Ernst's grave in Berlin was almost certainly destroyed by the Nazis. His brother Theodor has a grave in the air, in the words of the great German-speaking poet, Paul Salon. The legal clerk who precipitated my grandfather's death and the concentration camp official who turned on the gas that killed my great uncle, as Salon famously wrote, played with snakes and dreamt of death as a master from Germany. Er spielt mit den Schlangen und träumt den der Tod ist ein Meister aus Deutschland. These near ancestors, just two of the millions who perished as a result of those terrible events, 
have posed these kinds of questions of identity, belonging, and cultural memory that have certainly shaped my own life, and that I think also face our times with great force. I can't let go of them, but nor can I remember them merely with candles once a year, commemorating their lives and the ungraspable injustice of their deaths. To me, as I said at the outset, remembrance means attending to the very personal questions that the beloved dead force us to face. And it means giving thanks for the life, the values and the goals and the secrets that they bequeathed us, their descendants. But today, I think, notwithstanding the ghastly events that we're witnessing right now, for all the appalling prejudice against the outsider and the exile that still stalks our Western societies, we, we do in fact more freely choose where we belong, who we are and who we are to become. As I suggested in opening, the dead whom we love aren't passive. And I know for my part that even when I think I've done my best to open myself to their challenges and gifts, I'm still fumbling. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Simon, for this. Um, to go yes, uh, for this um, astonishing, um, personal, wide-ranging lecture that, that sort of touched on so many themes. Um, I'm going to open the floor to questions. Um, if you are watching this on Zoom and would like to ask a question, please type it in the chat. And I will collect those in a bit and 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 read them out. But we'll start um, with the questions in the room. If anyone has some. Um, why did your mother choose to marry a Jewish man? Um, you know, I asked her that question, and she said, um, I could only, I could only marry a Jew. I mean, I feel a little embarrassed saying that because it always sounds so ethnically, uh, I don't know what the word is, but anyway, that, that was her answer. That was her answer. I asked her that many times, and they have a terrible conflict, which, you know, didn't do their marriage any good about uh, the Catholicism, which he deeply disliked, not because he disliked the tenets of the religion, but because of his experience. He came from the southwest of Germany, Cologne, actually originally from Trier, where there is still a remarkable old Jewish graveyard where my ancestors are buried, undisturbed. Um, you know, that's a Catholic part of Germany and he'd not had good experiences there. But, uh, they sorted out that problem pragmatically. And the idea was that we were to be raised in both religions until 12, 13, then we would be given a choice. And it would be either confirmation or bar mitzvah. But the crucial thing, as I said, and I said maybe this is too much information, was, you know, there is something that gets a bit painful to have later on. And that they insisted that we, that my mother insisted, together with my father, that we had at birth. I mean, I hear Bruce, yeah. So I have a question about the, the three sisters. Um, do you recall that you had any sources how they talked about the ways they negotiated their identity? Um, how did they kind of make it work, so to say, about the sisters? The two other sisters. Yes, I mean, I have... Uh, I mean, I was obsessed with this question, these questions ever since I was very, you know, I was really a, a small, very small child. I don't know why, but I think because I needed to find my place in the world. And, you know, I grew up in this community here, which was entirely German speaking. I mean, in terms of the people who came to our house, I never heard a word of English in our homes, in, my, in our home ever. Um, so I felt, and then I had these relatives in Germany, many more than this country. I have almost no relatives in this country. They're in America, they're in Canada, they're in 
various places, but there are a lot in Germany, from those two sisters. And I loved my aunts, uh, and I basically interrogated them from the earliest, my earliest childhood I can remember. And the short version is that they, they both, I'm never quite sure of the phenomenology of this, so speak, I mean, how it was to experience this, but they, they, my, oh, the oldest aunt, Ilza, basically no longer believed she was Jewish to the best of my, I mean, I asked her this repeatedly and one side of it was that she's, I said, well, you, were you afraid in the Third Reich? I said, I was never afraid. I was afraid, the first time I was afraid was when the Soviet soldiers came to Berlin uh, because of the stories of rape and pillaging and so on. But she was never afraid. That's what she said. And there was something deeply convincing about that. And um, it's just possible that the fact that she hid Jews together with this other lady I referred to, uh, in a sense, convinced her that she wasn't one of them. She was hiding other people. But I mean, how you explain, you know, to actually, you would need a novelist to, to describe the consciousness of, you know, what it means to do that without somewhere believing it. I can't believe she didn't somewhere believe it because she knew what happened. I mean, anyway, Orzel was a much more complicated case and was really split. So she, uh, she did not deny it at all. I mean, she basically said it had ruined her life. The first part of the Van Hagen uh, quote I read out was very much her. Um, and she despised the fact she was lumbered with it, so to speak. Um, she kept it a complete secret from her in-laws. Unbelievably, her in-laws never knew her heritage, including her husband did, but nobody else. Um, and she kept it a secret. So she was split. And it was really a question of a secret, but it, there was also a very strong internal element because the hatred was so strong of the heritage that, you know, she, at the same time, this is very hard to describe. I mean, but I can only tell you that, uh, you know, I asked her many thousands of times, I said, how do you feel? I mean, how do you feel? And uh, my mother was the only one who really, was clear about it, though she also hid it, of course, in a bizarre way. And, uh, but, um, I mean, one of the most striking things to me was that when we, or we, but I mean, when they got the building restituted in Berlin, which was, you know, as many others, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, because it was in East, East Berlin, and then it all came to light and so on, Orzel refused to accept her share of the money now, that's something that most people accept money, you know. They, their principles are flexible if they see a large check, and it was a large check. Um, she didn't want the money, and she never accepted it. It was never in her bank account. And she said, uh, you know, she said, my mother should have it. And then my mother said, no, that's out of the question. And then she said, well, my children should have it. She did not want it. And she didn't want to know anything about the entire process, because getting the thing back once we were alerted to it, was a huge saga, which I won't, there's no time to go into it now, but it was quite a saga of extraordinary files that were discovered complete and then that vanished in ministries and then came to light again, thanks to the work of an extraordinary lawyer in Berlin, um, a non-Jewish lawyer who just felt these things needed to be pursued. Uh, but anyway, you know, I, I always felt that when she refused the money, that really said something. But you know, for a complete experiential description, I mean, that's it's too private. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, and I don't have the novelistic ability to to describe it. Mm -hmm. So there are some questions in the chat. Anyway, uh, someone asked, and you will be able to repeat the question if there are uh, other people oh. in the audience because uh, for the Zoom, for the Zoom, hello Zoom audience. Yeah. For the Zoom audience to repeat yeah, them, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'll read a couple out um, to start with. Thank you for sharing, so for the board. Thank you for sharing your family's story, uh, even though it cost you. You've given us a lot to think about. What is the biggest question and the most important lesson 
that you carry with you about flash from Lebanon? So the question is, what is what is the biggest question that I carry with me as a result of the heritage I've been describing? Um, I mean, the biggest the biggest question, which, uh, the biggest personal question is, who am I? Um, and what kind of activity in life, what kind of way of living life best gives expression to my, you know, thoroughly confused in some ways identity. So I haven't mentioned the whole question of being an inherited, a hereditary, what I call a hereditary refugee, but in some ways the question of identity was much harder I think I'm not being a crybaby here, but it was much harder for my generation than for my parents, in a sense, hard though it was for them, because they, and I used to have this discussion with my mother a lot, that, um, I mean, they did have very, very strong roots in that one culture, and in for those who didn't have this complexity in two cultures, uh, their Jewish and their German identity, um, and they fell back on that their whole lives. I mean, their whole lives were constructed out of that, you know, e.g. the music. Um, whereas we were grew up within this extremely strong atmosphere in which we were, I mean, we were also told that we, this might be unusual, uh, again, unusually extreme, we were told that we would be betraying our ancestry if we ever identified as British culturally. And yet that's, I mean, this is the country in which we grew up. So what else were we expected to do? Um, but it was, a, it was betrayal is not too strong a word. So we, in a sense, had to continue that identity, uh, to continue to live it out at a time and place where it was no longer, no longer existed. I mean, obviously, obviously that German Jewish world vanished with Hitler um, and it, sort of somehow continued in the salons of London and New York in particular. But, uh, and I mean, I know many people of my generation and above, because in a sense, I should be 20 years older than I am, because my parents had me very, very late. My father was in his 50s and my mother uh, 44, which was very late in those days. Um, but, you know, so, so, so for, for, that was the hardest question, I would say, for me personally. I mean, then, you know, having a philosophical disposition there, of course, you know, it raised lots of questions of identity and belonging to which I alluded. But, you know, I could answer those in a more abstract way. But in personal terms, it's, you know, what, what do I do with this mandate to continue a world that has been destroyed? Uh, my reaction was to both love it, but also to rebel against it and sort of want to do you know, be as, as it were, throw myself as much as possible into the into the contemporary world. I mean, including in art, in music and art. I mean, so I, I insisted on contemporary music, contemporary art, contemporary dance, and so on, um, and resisted a lot of the classical, the classical forms of those. So, I don't know. I'm still struggling with it, as I said at the end. It's not resolved. Um, I'll read up one more. The online questions uh, says Sue Weiss, thank you for the excellent talk. Do you think your mother's wish to return to Berlin is a wish to return to Jewishness too? How do you see the two as relating? That's a very good question, and I never, I never thought about that. Um, that's a, that's such a good question. So, um, I think it must have been a desire to return to a disappeared world, which was a German Jewish world. Um, she loved Berlin. I mean, she refused ever to condemn anything to do with Berlin. On the contrary, she always said, yeah, the Berliners were never Nazis and so on. Um, you know, and Hitler knew it. And he, you know, he, I mean, she's not saying this as a historian. I'm just saying, you know, that was her defense of Berlin and Hitler knew it. And he always mistrusted the Berliners and they were free spirited and so on. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it, I think what she wanted to do was to turn the clock back, was to return. She also never really felt at home here. 
though she was ex like my father didn't either, but they were extremely patriotic. I mean, that was, I think, a cliche for those of you who know anything about that world. So, you know, famously GB, which they stuck on their cars, the first people, you know, was, they said, oh, you can always recognize a refugee because it stands for German born or geworden British. So because they were extremely, no word of criticism of this country was ever allowed. I mean, I had many criticisms. You know, I grew up in the 70s when the country was falling apart as it's now doing again. And, uh, you know, I criticized everything. In fact, especially when we went to Germany and everything seemed to function so well and look so good. I said, this country is a basket case. And she, she refused. This was unsayable, unthinkable. And, you know, it, it was cut off immediately. So there was huge gratitude at the same time as feeling uh, culturally completely alien and washed up here. And the desire was, I think, to return, yes, to some Elysium, to use Walter Benjamin's word, uh, which, of course, was not available. And on that trip that I referred to after she nearly died, we actually had a rather absurdly comical experience. Uh, I took her to the Berlin Ensemble, the Brecht Theatre, you know, um, to a performance, a Kleist play. I think it was Der Zerbrochene Krug. And... Um, which is an, a very long play. And I think it was performed without an interval, if I remember correctly. And as we came out of the theater, my mother froze and she saw a man who was very tall. This is completely absurd, but very telling. And she said, Simon, she said, Simon, Simon, that man is just so disgusting. He's so tall. He's one of them. I said, what on earth are you talking about? She said, that's what the Nazis look like. They have those tall, lanky legs and those Steilköpfe, if anyone knows what that means. This, this was a way of referring to a kind of head that she claimed Nazis had. And she said, I have to get out of this city and this country immediately. And I said, you're completely mad. I mean, this is not obviously nonsense. I mean, Hitler wasn't tall for a start. Anyway, it's total nonsense. And the irony was that as we left the theater, we heard this man talk and he was American. So it, it, it but it just triggered some, something very deep in her. So it was very complicated, very ambiguous. And I think it's just as well she didn't move back because in case of unfortunate encounters with people her own age, I mean. There's a lady at the back who's asking a question. Yes, just to continue with that. Uh, the experience, which I think could be otherwise, and would have made an enormous difference. And that was that she came to London. If I thought I was born in Munich and came to this country in 1949, everybody went up. Yes. Oh, yeah. She was able to negotiate a lot of these identity issues with, I think, much more ease because he didn't go to London. His parents lived briefly in London, but then they moved to Winchester, where there was no option to mingle with a Central European, exclusively Central European. Right, because uh, there were none there. Um, there were well, very few. Very, very, very few. So they, uh, they did a bit later. My, my grandfather would have gone back to. Germany after the war, he was really playing uh, part of Germany, particularly the publisher of Hayes in Germany. Wow. Um, but he died in the future. My grandmother had to stay, stayed, and so my father embraced England, became a, a historian of, of, of Britain and one of Germany, and I think therefore has had these. Kinds of difficulties with with identity. I mean, he was still he's still in the forties, I mean, more than really Englishman, but and is still very uh, engaged with German culture and uh, some of his audience is being from German. But um, I think that because of not being in London, these these issues were easier to be in, in, in Yeah. So you haven't got a microphone, so I better repeat the gist of that for the online audience. I mean, which is basically that the lady who I think your name is Feuchtwager, you said? Yes. Wow. 
Um, well, uh, she's saying that um, her grandfather and father moved, lived in Winchester, uh, and that the option to have a German stroke, Austrian stroke, Czech, German, and so on, refugee circle to ensconce themselves in did not exist in a city like Winchester. Uh, and that in a sense that made things easier, if I understood you correctly. Um, I think I would probably disagree with you respectfully, um, which is that, uh, I mean, I know that if my parents had found themselves in Winchester, they would have fled to London. I mean, they would have, they would simply have left and they wouldn't have tolerated it. They just couldn't do it. So your grandparents were very flexible in a way that I'm not used to. I mean, uh, most of, I mean, I think my parents, my mother, so well, both my parents were, it's in some ways extreme, but so to speak, still typical. And uh, I could name many, many names, including the father of Johnny Reisenstein, who's sitting there, who was a distinguished composer from Nuremberg, studied with in the Mitten Schoenberg in Berlin, and uh, you know, who, who dedicated the piece to my mother. Um, and uh, I mean, I cannot imagine France in, you know, in a in an environment where he didn't have his kind to talk to. Uh, and also, you know, professionally, also, it's not just a matter of dinners in the evening or you know weekends it's, it's it was a professional thing and there was this very tight circle um so anyway so sorry that's a very long answer but i would respectfully disagree i think you know it just depends on the particular on the particular person i mean i do know people too who changed their names married non-germans non-german jews uh and um and uh you know became so british uh, so to speak, at least to the outside. And um, I think Zeba discusses this wonderfully in one or, one or two of the of the stories in the the immigrants. I mean, I can't remember now the names. It's too long since I read the book. But um, you know, he encounters people who he, he doesn't realize at first where they're from, and then it all it slowly percolates. It so slowly comes out. Maybe give the microphone so that yes. our Zoom audience can hear. Thank you, first of all, for your extremely moving lecture. Your phrase of uh, the dead we love a lot passive is an extraordinary moving thought because I cannot get out of my mind. My grandfather actually was photographed in my wall and that uh, came out. Studying European Jewish history, I just couldn't get out of my mind. Certain things that I just could not explain. And that leads me to like, what I can only ask a rhetorical question, really. To what extent is it really possible to remain oneself content and liberated uh, without one's, one's Jewish culture? I'm looking at my father, who tried desperately. To deny it, he became a sad, a sad person who wanted to be dead on. Crying almost to be anti Semitic by the end sure. of the end. In a very tragic way, and I don't think he ever really recovered from his attempt to deny it and become part of the industry. And my own sudden realization that everything that was going on in my head, like a Right down from love of Lisa, German Lisa, and German literature, all my thoughts I suddenly realized were actually sort of Jewish culture, which I had failed to understand for a very long time. And it suddenly made sense once I began to put that in context. So I suppose my question is is it, is it actually possible to deny something that is so deep in your personal thinking that without becoming very Angry with myself, whether I'm myself, because I'm almost shutting up shop. And what particularly fascinates me is the degree to which it gets handed down from next generation. Then that. You mean the memory or the denial of it? Sorry? You mean the memory or the denial? What gets handed down? I think the memory of it gets handed down to the point where it's almost impossible to deny it and without actually initially understanding what it was. 
especially for the product of fashion, have you got any view what your thoughts are on that? Um, well, it's such a huge, it's a huge question. I mean, a set of questions. Um, I mean, as the quote from Sholem I read out, certainly he would, you know, suggest that he, he would think it's not possible to get rid of the heritage mm -hmm. somewhere. It exists in some form, call it concealed, call it sublimated or what, you know, in some way. The question is what that means. Mm -hmm. You know, it kind of sound it's kind of an easy thing to say, but what does it mean to have? I don't know. I mean, this is, you know, then one's just appealing to fairly standard, I think, psychoanalytic concepts, like, you know, what happens to repression? What happens to sublimation? I mean, how is it really expressed? Is it expressed through, I don't know, you know, through, um, is it expressed? I mean, is it expressed through actually really having a sort of a sense of belonging and identity and consciousness, or is it expressed in some other way? Um, I, I mean, these are all questions I don't, I certainly don't have a succinct answer to, um, to them. Things that have happened within my personality, I now realize are very much part of that Germanic Jewish heritage. Such as what? Um, it's particularly. I don't know, it's part of the refugee experience, it's part of the love of German, love of German culture, part of the sense of humor. Uh, it's, and it's something that I didn't realize, I couldn't deny it. So I right. summarized as that and realized oh, that was what I had to aim to do myself. So I'm sure. actually gravitating to the people who do without you know, explaining it. Right. So my father was trying to gravitate to the words. He got increasingly um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I just know people who span the spectrum. I know people who really did deny it com completely and yet seem to live very contented lives, um, you know, and where you didn't feel that there was some sort of residual anger that was that was poisoning poisoning them or holding them back. And in other cases where, where that was it was transparently the case that there was. So it just depends. It depends on factors. I just cannot, you know, isolate. There's so many variables there, and also attraction. As I mean, as I suggested towards the end, you know, when I mentioned the example of Ruth, uh, you know, Ruth and Naomi in the Bible. I mean, you know, we can, and there are many people these days. I mean, some of the best books, you know, on the the magnificence of German culture, so to speak, you know, like the former German um, director of the British Museum. Um, and there's one other one, I can't remember the title of it, but there are many. I mean, are written by, you know, non-German, non-Jews. And I mean, one can identify with, I know these are very mysterious questions. It's really questions that are going to be raised in me rather than I don't really have any answers, except I do feel I do in the case of my own family. So it's very individual. I, I might be completely wrong. You know, maybe my grandfather had other, what, you know, nowadays what we call issues, but I think this was, you know, a very, um, I think this was, you know, this was, I know this was huge. I know it from all his three children. I mean, he was, you know, he was absolutely desperate. He really felt he'd done everything he could to be a good German and a good patriot. And I know that's almost a cliche, you know, um, but, um, and I was recently contacted by an archive in Berlin I uh, can't remember how they actually found me, but um, it's kind of about an archive that said, you know, we have, obviously this was very moving for me. We uh, have, is your grandfather Ernst Lieb? And someone said, yes, uh, born so and so and so. And uh, they said, we have a letter from him to the, your mother's violin teacher, who was a famous teacher called Max Rostar, a violin teacher, uh, uh, who also taught the Amadeus string quartet and many, many people, um, uh, thank he, uh, um, begging him to, to get your mother out of Germany, A, and B, saying to him, because my mother had, was I think then 14, something like that, and had gone to study with him, uh, and saying, look, you do understand that for people in our position, by which he meant Jews, uh, I take it, well, he, he could only have meant Jews, I will, I will no longer be able to go on paying you. So I'm asking you to teach my daughter for, for nothing. 
And I know that's a big ask because you yourself, he'd just been thrown out of the Hochschule for Musik in Berlin and was himself not earning money. So, you know, it was a big, but anyway, this sort of just came to light. It's unbelievable just uh, a few months ago. Um, so, you know, the, the history never kind of stops nosing its way into one's life. Well, I don't really feel I have the right to say in public how they view their identity. I mean, that's a very personal matter for them if they wish to talk about it. Um, but I, I mean, I'm very close to them. Um, you know, very close to them because, I mean, they're significantly older cousins uh, because my aunt married when she was younger than my mother. Um, and, you know, I've always regarded them as very protective, as also, also, you know, as having maintained a foothold in that country, although not in the culture the same we were. That's the interesting thing. Um, you know, we were brought up much more in the way one was brought up in the 30s. That's the crazy thing, um, uh, you know, with all that sort of veneration of, and it's probably not a coincidence that I turned to German philosophy and so on. I mean, not because I felt I needed to learn. It, it wasn't primarily because I wanted to root myself in that culture. It was just because I was, I was, it spoke to me in a way that a lot of Anglophone philosophy just didn't. You know, I learned it because I had to uh, and passed exams in it. But German, you know, much German, yeah, really from Leibniz onwards, you know, really spoke to me deeply. And I was, you know, wasn't sure why. The questions, the way of our, the way of addressing the questions. But anyway, um, so in a funny way, I felt, and my my brother and I felt more uh, strongly about that whole German heritage than I think it's fair to say, and this I can say, than, than perhaps they do. Um, they also, of course, had very, very different paternal parent. Uh, you know, I mean, their father was a landed aristocrat. You know, my father was a was a a German Jew from actually a very religious background. So, you know, I mean, I mean, his his ancestors were all rabbis in, in the city of Trier, where Karl Marx comes from. And uh, you know, so I mean, our pa our paternal parentage couldn't be couldn't be more different. Do they have any Jewish feelings at all? Sorry? Do they have any Jewish feelings? Well, as I say, I don't really want, you know, this is such a sensitive topic, I don't really want to speak for them. Yeah. I, mean, I know that might be a bit restrictive, but Professor Jeans, no less. Thanks, Daniel, for allowing this talk. Um, you, you started off with saying, you started off with saying that if you, the question you have is a question of your identity. And I'm wondering if this is a different way to formulate it. And this is a point thing you said to me before, too. It's like you can't be an assimilated German Jew. That position doesn't exist. They're not really Jewish. They're not really British. So, in a sense, maybe it's not the question is what's my identity, but my question is do I exist? Wait a minute. Do I exist or do you exist? Do you exist? It's a bit of a Cartesian question to throw at me. Um, Body. I mean, sometimes I, from talking to you and things you've written, I get a sense that the real question is a sense of not a sense of an existential crisis and not feeling one self really. Exists. Yeah, no, I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, it's difficult to explain what it means to say one doesn't exist when you know palpably do and you exist through your acts and so on. But uh, yeah, I, I think I have a. I mean, I take issue with what you said about me not feeling Jewish because I feel very Jewish indeed. Uh, I mean, there's the old debate about whether it's just a religion or whether it's you know, the cultural memory uh, and so on. But I mean, without yeah, getting into that, religious. well, yeah, but yeah, but I mean, you know, there are many non-religious Jews in the world who feel extremely Jewish. I mean, that's a whole minefield. Yeah. It's not a minefield, but it's a very complicated area. But I could definitely say that you know, not adhering to the religion, uh, though I find myself moving closer and closer to it as the years go by, in no way 
stops me from feeling very strongly that identity. Uh, I hate the word identity in a way, but although I've been using it all the time, but um, you know, I, I don't know. It's a, a very, it's a deep sense of uh, of belonging in that, definitely. But I mean, and you know, there are so many ways of, there are so many kinds of Jews. I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, there are Jews in many different countries, which, which we, we don't share this, anything like the same cultural memory. You meet them all the time in, in Israel and elsewhere uh, who are very different. But um, no, but you're absolutely right. I mean, and I have told you this and uh, I've already even written about it. I mean, I do have a sense of extreme existential fragility, which can blend into a sort of disbelief that I exist at all but that's very difficult to explain i mean uh and it of course you know it's not a skepticism about physical existence it's it's a skepticism about and it's not just a sense of fragility either because i could exist have a conception of my own self-existence and yet feel fragile that's just one of the predicates of my existence but i mean it goes beyond that it's it's sometimes a question of do i really do I actually exist? I mean, maybe this is deeply pathological. I shouldn't be confessing all this in front of an audience, but uh, it is, it is, uh, it's got better with the years, but with huge amount of work. I mean, I think, you know, it's, I mean, people like us, if I can say it, I mean, not you, but people, I'm trying to sort of wrap myself into a generality here, uh, not to be too exposed, but I think, you know, we have to work at existence uh, and this is not just a matter of identity in a way that most people can take for granted. Uh, well, they just don't even, it isn't an issue. And it's nothing to do with fear of death, uh, you know, the fragility of life and all that. I mean, you know, that you can get ill tomorrow and be dead next week or die in a car crash. It's got absolutely nothing to do with that. It's a really difficult one to articulate, but um, it has to do it, or at least it's manifested in a sense of having a, you know, a firm groundedness in the world uh, that that is unquestionable in some sense. This, again, there's nothing to do with staying alive, you know, or being robust in that sense. But it's yeah, it's very difficult to explain. But it's definitely there. It's a very strong feeling, uh, and it's got better over the years, only as a result of an you know enormous effort which usually is not direct. It's it's to do with doing things that I deeply love and attracted to, like philosophy, um, without which I really wouldn't exist. Um, music and so on, friends of a certain kind, um, perhaps even a sort of Aristotelian type of friend, you know, who reflects, who can reflect you back to yourself and with whom you can feel a common soul uh, something Montaigne describes beautifully in his essay on friendship. Very short. I recommend it to anyone who wants to pursue this. Um, yeah. So, I mean, some sense of, so, so the sense of existence doesn't come from simply, you know, despite everything I said, from just, you know, trying to nail down an identity that's really mine in some sense. It doesn't come from that. Yeah. So we have um, one more question in the chat that's been patiently waiting, so I'll read it out, and I think that'll be our final question of the evening. Uh, Christina Puyol says, thank you for sharing this personal and indescribably painful story with us. You describe how refugees face a constant transience. Did this sense of displacement in your carer's identity become apparent as you were growing up? Could it be described as analogous to nostalgia or Heimdall? That's a great question. Um, well, I mean, yes, I mean, absolutely. The sense of dis displacement was, was not just there. It structured the whole of life. It was in absolutely everything. And almost everything that was done, you know, whether what I've described, you know, whether playing, having musical evenings, whether the circles we lived in, very, very crucially, I could write a whole essay on this, I think. Uh, the Swiss Alps, this is a whole separate topic, but the Swiss Alps played an absolutely vital role 
in my parents' lives, uh, I mean, life-saving role. Um, and this is very hard to explain, but it has to do with the, funnily enough, I had dinner with uh, the former Swiss ambassador here, who was a friend of a friend, who's a friend of mine, a friend of a friend of mine. And I tried to I explain this to him, thinking he would be flattered, but, or at least he would, you know, go, oh, you know, wonderful that my country played this kind of role. I mean, not just, you know, a nice, clean, convenient place to go to. And I think he thought I was completely nuts. I mean, uh, you know, I said, you know, this the, the Alps have for us a metaphysical grounding uh, and are indispensable. And, you know, anyway, um, so, so many things, yes, that... Now then, the final your final point online point was uh, was about um, nostalgia, and I mean there was an element, of course, of very very yes. I mean to, to the extent that you know that was the I, that was the Elysium, that pre-war world of this obviously to some degree or to a large degree imagined. You know, again, there's a huge scholarly literature on this, which I don't even didn't even dare to talk about, but imagined German Jewish synthesis and, you know, and so on. Um, and obviously a lot of that was idealized. Um, but I mean, at the same time, a lot of it did exist and was it stunningly fertile, as we all know. Um, yes, there was a great nostalgia for, for that and in some way to return to that. And the, and the vehicle... In my family, probably different than every family, the vehicle was music. And it was ultimately music was, in a sort of Schopenhauerian sense, the only, was the metaphysical, spoke the language, the metaphysical language of, the, of existence. That might sound highfalutin, but, but it wasn't. It was actually probably the single most concrete thing that they felt. It was more concrete than anything else. So music was what spoke of existence in a really metaphysical sense, as Schopenhauer articulates it, one reason why Wagner loved him so much. Uh, and um, through music, one had the hope of attaining security and firm existence, a firm, so solid grounding roots in the world. Through German music in particular, my parents were always very scathing about French music. So it is. Um, but uh, so yes, so there was a there was a if you call that nostalgia, it wasn't a simple nostalgia. It was, but it was it was a sense that only there in that world could grounding and therefore a sort of redemption from the horrors of displacement and exile be found. Yeah. Um. Again, Professor Simon May for this um, really um, fascinating lecture and fascinating question and answer session. There are some refreshments at the back um, if you'd like to join us uh, after, after the talk. But um, thank you again. Thank you very much.